We are so pleased you've joined us today for St. Stephen's Online. We're praying for you as you watch this, wherever you're tuning in from. Lord God, be with us as we worship together and listen to today's talk. Spirit break out Break our walls down Spirit break out Heaven come Heaven come down Oh Spirit break Spirit break
Why not open your Bible or click on the link below to read the passage before we hear from our speaker. Father God, we just thank you uh, that you are here with us. And thank you that we can read really, really ancient stories in the Bible. And through the power of your spirit, you still speak to us today. And so we pray uh, for each other and for ourselves that you open our ears to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for the last uh, week, I've been on holiday in uh, Wales, let me tell you. It was about half the degrees that it was in London, uh, in Wales, but it was beautifully full, and we did lots of jumping off cliffs, because that's what you do when you're in Wales, into the sea, our nation to add, bodyboarding and other things like that. So we had a great time away, came back on Thursday night, having a little scroll in the car on the five-hour journey, and Instagram told me this. It is 21 weeks till Christmas. There you go. And and some of us are excited already about uh, Christmas, but maybe you are somebody that, you know, now you're a slightly bigger uh, child. Uh, you're, You're less excited than you were as a child. But when you think back to how you were when you were four or five or six or seven years old, I bet I'm not the only one in this room who used to get really really super excited for Christmas. Give me a wave if you were a child like me. Uh, I was one of those children as well. I would literally be counting down the days till Christmas, you know, having that huge sense of anticipation and excitement. I remember when I was about seven or eight years old, uh, we had a Christmas tree in our lounge and we lived away from where lots of our family lived at that time. And so parcels used to arrive and gradually the pile of presents under the tree got a little bit bigger. And more and more parcels were arriving. And as as you do when you're seven, I would go into the language when my mum and dad weren't around and I'd maybe get a parcel and see if it had a label for me on it. And I might pick it up, give it a little shake, give it a little squeeze, uh, see what was inside. I couldn't wait for Christmas. I just wanted to open those presents that were for me. And there was one particular day when my waiting and curiosity got the better of me. And I got up really early. This is like confessions of living. I got up really, really early in the morning. I snuck downstairs. I think it was about six o'clock in the morning. That was another thing. And I went in and I found one of the presents that was mine under the tree. And I took it and I'd done a whole shape Sounds interesting. And you know what I did? I just feel that the side of tape. And I'm going down more estimations as we speak. And feel that the side of tape. Yep. And I open the parcel really carefully and kind of look inside. And I saw the letters E and L, A, Y. The next letter was M. Guess what was in my parcel? Main D and play a B L. And I really, you know, the little sets of Playmobil you get in the small boxes. I really wanted this set of Playmobil. And my mum must have told the auntie or the godparent or wherever it was, I think, you this Playmobil. And I was so excited. And then I gradually and really carefully just folded up the parcel, put the tape back down in and popped it back under it. The tree. I've never told. I never told my mum, and I've never told my dad that before. I feel like I need to ring it up later and confess to you. Nobody knew what I'd done. But the problem was, is that actually, it was a bit of a sort of miserable thing for me to do. Because I really kind of wait to open that parcel. But actually, I felt really bad knowing what I'd done, and that I'd done something so naughty in my seven-year-old mind. But also, I spoiled the surprise. Sometimes waiting is actually a really good thing, it lets, as we anticipate something that is to come. It can be a sense of excitement. Maybe you're waiting to go on a holiday or waiting to start university or start a new job. And the waiting can be a really good thing. But we humans generally don't like to wait doing. It's not something that we enjoy doing. We don't like waiting for anything. 
But that's okay because Amazon has changed everything for us. How do we think about it? How much has Amazon changed everything for us? Now, when we realize that we need something now, we open our Amazon app and we actually like in our bank account first, check we've got some money in there. Uh, so we open, go up to our Amazon app, of our maps are available for shopping, I pay some to it. We click on the thing that we want after a little scroll and comparison. We don't even have to waste time now putting our bank details into our phone because Amazon, praise the Lord, has a special memory and saves them for us as well. It blows my mind. And we press buy and the thing that I can't possibly live another day without arrives the next morning. <laughs> Getting what we need on demand is now so normal for most of us in the Western world that we really struggle with waiting. But the problem is, is that Amazon doesn't deliver everything we need. It doesn't deliver healing for hurt. It doesn't re- deliver the return of that prodigal that we've been praying for. Amazon doesn't bring comfort for grieving. Amazon doesn't give us hope if we're longing for that relationship. Amazon doesn't bring relationship for somebody who's lonely or freedom to the oppressed or justice for those who've been abused. But as Christians, we know that God can deliver those things, but we're still rubbish at waiting. We pray, but we just don't know when God's going to deliver the package that we put the order in for. And we find ourselves in a place of waiting and we're deeply frustrated. And we maybe ask along with Isaiah, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? And I'm sure that every single person in this room has had a time in our lives where you've struggled in the waiting, where you've said, how long, O Lord? Maybe at the moment you're waiting for something in your life to change and it feels like it's never going to change. Maybe you're waiting for a a change in your job, a difficult situation or for a new job or a job at all. Maybe you're waiting to feel better. Maybe you're waiting for something good like holiday. Maybe you're waiting for somebody to become a, a Christian, for your situation to change, waiting for healing. And you've prayed and you've waited and it feels like God hasn't heard or he's forgotten, but he definitely hasn't answered that prayer that we tried him. And today as we meet Joseph uh, through this, we're going through Joseph in our services uh, through the summer. We're going to meet Joseph in Genesis 41. And Joseph is somebody who knew what it was to wait. Now, up to this point, when we make him in Genesis 41, Joseph's life has already been marked by suffering and rejection and enslavement and abandonment and accusation and waiting. He's not had a good time. He's had a bit of a rough ride. And Joseph is well practiced in waiting. He's done a lot of waiting for the situation to change, waiting for somebody to notice of him, waiting for somebody to free him waiting for God to just do something. And during those times of waiting, he probably felt like nothing was going to change. But actually, as we'll discover as we look uh, deeper at this passage, God was always with Joseph. God was at work in his life and in a situation, often in ways that Joseph didn't know about at the time. God was with him. Now, a few years before the events that we're going to look at in uh, Genesis 41, Joseph finds himself imprisoned uh, by Potiphar. Do you remember the story? Okay, Potiphar's naughty wife makes accusations about him. And he finds himself sharing at prison with the Pharaoh's cupbearer and the Pharaoh's chief baker. And one night, the cupbearer and the chief baker 
both have uh, disturbing dreams and Joseph interprets them uh, for them. Uh, and as predicted, uh, a couple of days later, uh, the chief baker makes an untimely end and the cup baker, a uh, cup bearer gets released. And Joseph had asked the cupper on his release to remember him when he's free, to remember me to Pharaoh, to remember to tell Pharaoh that there's this guy, Joseph, who's been wrongly imprisoned to get him out of prison. But once that cupbearer is free, it seems that he's forgotten Joseph. And Joseph goes on to spend two more years in that jail. Knowing the man that he had helped get out of jail, hadn't remembered him. Just two more years of life on hold. Two more years of nothing. Two more years where he's been abandoned and forgotten again, sat in this real, dark, desperate, desperate dungeon, waiting. Maybe you have or are experiencing something similar as you wait for a diagnosis. As you wait for something in your situation or somebody's place to you, situation to change, for your health or the health of somebody you love to improve. And you're struggling to find any hope in the darkness and the endlessness of your situation. And you, like Joseph, might be sat there thinking, yeah, it does feel like God has forgotten me or forgot me during that period of my life. It does feel like I'm sat in a pit and I'm crying out, where are you, God? And why haven't you done anything? I'm sure all of you here uh, know about Nelson Mandela. He was famously imprisoned as a political prisoner in South Africa uh, because of his views against apartheid. There he is looking uh, like a very wise old man. But he's there with his um, self that he ended up in. Uh, in, in, in Robin Island. He was given a prison sentence that didn't have an end. And he actually spent 27 years in prison. 18 of those were in the infamous Robin Island. Uh, and he stayed at this cell, which was 2.4 meters by 2.1 meters, just such an incredibly small space. And every day he recounts in his autobiography about how he had to work in a limestone quarry alongside other prisoners there. And, in, and most of the tasks that he did were completely pointless. And you can see in this picture uh, that actually the prisoners are in a yard and they're just chipping off tiny bits of uh, rock to make it to gravel. But most days, uh, Nelson Mandela's job was to carry rocks from one side of a quarry to another, pick them up, and take them to the other side, day after day after day, for no purpose. Nelson Mandela faced an incredible hardship and pointless waiting. But during that time, he learned so much about himself. He got a better education. He was refined. He helped other prisoners. And when he was released after 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela came out a different man. He was ready to lead his country to freedom with wisdom and grace and dignity in a way that he says he would never have been able to do before he went into prison. During those years of suffering and waiting, and no doubt hopelessness and anger and frustration, Mandela was being refined. He was refined like gold. I've got a couple of lovely uh, rings uh, that are gold, which I've inherited. Now, unfortunately, it'd be amazing on that if we could like just go into a field and dig up a beautiful piece of jewelry. Uh, but that's not how uh, jewelry comes about. A gold ring doesn't just happen. It, and he goes through a long and arduous process to get to the point where it's a beautiful piece of jewellery. The gold has to be dug out of the granite. The ore is refined through a series of intensive processes to become pure gold before it's painstakingly shaped and hammered into whatever the gold is to become. Gold, as we receive it, 
doesn't just happen. It's a process which takes time and effort and pain and care to get to. And the end result is, is a beautiful piece of gold jewellery which emerges through the waiting. So after the cut there is released from prison, Joseph waits for two whole years in jail. Two years of waiting. And that's where we get to the beginning of chapter 41. And this is when Joseph's situation begins to change. We discover that after these two years of of waiting, they they haven't been wasted. God has been refining Joseph in the waiting period. Look at verses uh, 1 to 8. First of all, we we find out uh, a little bit about Pharaoh. He's had a series of disturbing, slightly weird dreams. And then verse 9, and he goes to the people he trusts that have wisdom in, in his culture. He calls for magicians and the wise men of Egypt, intelligent people. And these are the ones he trusts to help them out. And they tr- try desperately to work out what on earth Pharaoh's dreams might mean, but they're unable to help Pharaoh. And then verses 9 to 13, the long lost cupbearer of prison fame comes back into the picture. And hurrah, in that moment, he remembers Joseph. Joseph might be able to help out the Pharaoh. He's an interpreter of dreams. And so we get to verse 14, where uh, Jackie started reading today. The case quickens up. Joseph is brought out of prison. He's brought literally from the dungeon to a palace, from darkness to light. And I love it in verse 14, uh, that actually it tells us they want to shave. Great. Uh, and he pulls on new clothes. There we go, essential details. He, he, he tells us that actually Joseph's had a really rough time. He's probably got a really long, scraggy beard. His clothes are probably the clothes that he went into prison a few years ago. But he has a shave and he puts on new clothes and he's ready to be presented to Pharaoh. Who tells him his problem in verse 16. I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you, that when you hear of a dream, you can interpret it. Then, what is going to happen in this moment? <clears throat> what happens next will tell us the effects that the years of languishing in prison have had on Joseph. Is he going to be still the Joseph of Genesis 37? Oh. Oh multicolored, beautiful king's fame. Is he going to be that arrogance, wanting to be the centre of attention, Joseph? Or perhaps he'll be the Joseph who's built up a wall of bitterness and anger and resentment towards the cupbearer, towards his uh, situation. Will this be the moment when he takes the opportunity to take revenge? Or is he thinking... This is my payment. This is what everybody's going to just see and break on the hand, how wise I am, how gifted I am. I'm going to shame them all with my brilliance. It. But look what actually happens when Joseph comes out of this place of hardship and waiting and struggle. The first thing that he says to Pharaoh shows exactly how Joseph has been refined at this time of waiting. Look at verse 16. He says to Pharaoh, I cannot do it, Joseph replied. It's not about me. It's not about me. I can't do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answers he desires. He's basically saying, it's not about me. I cannot do it but God will do it. You see, I'm sure that in those years of waiting, something has changed in Joseph. Instead of highlighting in himself his own gifts and talents, he simply points to the power of the God in whom he trusts. It's God who deserves the glory. I can't do it, but God will. And not so often... Many of us cry out to God when things are tough. 
when we're waiting, when we're waiting for something to change and we lean on him and we make bargains with him, if you answer my prayer, if you change my situation, I will do this for you. I am not the only person in this room that's ever done that. I know you're not. I'll never sin again. I'll be the best Christian ever. I'm going to tell everybody at my workplace, my school, my college, my university, my friendship groups about Jesus if you do your part of the bargain, God. And then we find ourselves being brought out of our own version of the dungeon into the palace from darkness into light. And we're so chuffed that the situation has changed or got better. We get all carried away that everything is now very okay. And we forget to give God the glory. But the first thing that Joseph does, we shows us how he's been refined, is that he stops and he says to Pharaoh, I can't do it, but God will do it. He gives God the glory. Because something happened to Joseph in those two years of waiting. I, I think that probably Joseph met with God in a really deep way in that prison. And God was in the waiting. And he met God in that time of waiting and wrestling and crying out and asking for change. Then during that process, the Holy Spirit refined them. Because the arrogant, egotistical Joseph, who's thrown into prison by Potiphar, isn't the one who covers ours. Immediately we begin to see in the following verses a new depth of wisdom as well. A new depth in Joseph's understanding of who God is in the events which follow. I wonder if you resonate with this. I definitely do. When I'm in a period of waiting, when everything is stripped away, and I've tried everything, and I can't solve the problem in my own strength, when I just feel completely helpless, it is then that I reach out to God and I ask, why? And it's often in those times of waiting that we question everything. We wonder, God, do you really love me? Are you really involved in my life? Do you really have the power to change things? Are you even there? We wonder if he's abandoned us in our pain and then we wait. And when we throw ourselves onto him, we find out deep truths and we learn to trust and then we say, well, why should I trust you when nothing's changing? But we go on this backwards and forwards journey in that wrestle, in that time of waiting. And it isn't easy, but something happens to us when we throw ourselves to God on that, in those times of waiting. We're being refined. Before we lived uh, here, down here in Twickenham, we moved here in January, uh, we lived in Edinburgh in Scotland, and I mentioned that we moved there in uh, January 2016. And as with our move here, uh, we went for my job. And, uh, and for a year, my husband, John, didn't have a permanent job to go to. We knew that God had called us all to Edinburgh. That God hadn't just called me and everybody else was left to tag along uh, behind me. But actually, God, God, God knew what we all needed. He loves us all. So when we found it, we, or I found it really hard to understand why on earth, therefore, if God had called us all, why there was no job for John. It was deeply frustrating. It was really worrying uh, because uh, our financial situation depended on John having a job. And I couldn't understand what God was up to. And we literally got to the point where we thought, we're going to have to leave Edinburgh unless the situation changes. But looking back, I know that that year was a time of the refining. I think, if I'm honest, I was looking at our situation a bit like I was doing a transaction with God. We've been obedient, God. We followed your call. And now, God, you have to keep your part of the bargain and come up with the goods, you know, provide a job for John and make life straight, straight forward. Anybody else have those sorts of conversations with God in the reading? And into that space, I felt the Holy Spirit 
gently reminded me this. I cause you to follow me. And now you have to trust in me. And I never said it was going to be easy following me and then you're going to be my disciple. I never said that. But I've got this. And you've just got to trust that my timing is perfect. And it was a really hard thing because I had mind plan and I wanted God to fit in with it. But actually, after a pretty tough first year there, um, John ended up getting a, a job that he then had for the next seven years. And it wasn't all perfect. It wasn't all perfect. But once he got that job, the waiting and what happened during that period of time made sense. But also I felt and Joel felt that we had a deeper understanding of who God is and his relationship with us. We found that God was in the waiting, not just the end result of the waiting. God was in the waiting. Let's go back to Joseph. We're on verse 17. <laughs> Pharaoh then gives Joseph a bit of a rundown of the dream, and Joseph again points to God's involvement. Look at verse 25 there. Uh, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do, Joseph says. And then in case Pharaoh had understood, Joseph tells him again, God is speaking to you. And then verse 28 there. Uh, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. He's basically banging the message home to Pharaoh. The reason this dream was given to Pharaoh is because it's been firmly decided by God what's going to happen. Joseph is making it clear to Pharaoh that God has decided what's going to happen. So however then Pharaoh chooses to respond to what Joseph has shared, it's going to happen anyway. There is going to be seven years of plenty, and then there are going to be seven years of famine. And he's saying, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up for you, Pharaoh. God is all over this. And Joseph leaves them really clear. I cannot interpret your dreams. I'm just God's messenger. God has told me what he's going to say. God is in this, and God will do this. Joseph has been refined. And he speaks with that boldness and that confidence we've seen in him before. But now it comes from a place here in chapter 41, where through the waiting, he's been refined. And it comes from a place where Joseph trusts completely in God. God has refined Joseph. He's met with him. He's met with him in the waiting in a powerful way. And God has changed Joseph. So as we come into land, just a, cu- a couple of things to mention. If you're in a place of waiting for something at the moment, I wonder if there are one of these three things that might be helpful for you. I wonder if God's saying, you can trust in me. It's one of the hardest things to do, isn't it, as a Christian, as a follower of God. To actually go, you know, I do actually trust in you. Not just with my words, that's so easy to say, isn't it? But with my whole life. We can trust in God because of his promises to us, because of our, our experience of it, because he loves us. We might not understand his timings, but we can trust in him. And so maybe God is saying, you can trust in me. Just come and bring all that you are all the mess, all the waiting, all the struggle to me. And the second thing that, pray. And don't just pray, but wrestle in prayer. You might call it contending in prayer. Be persistent in prayer. Don't give up. Keep pushing into prayer when you're in that time of waiting. It might be that your your waiting is because you're Praying for somebody close to you because, to become a Christian. Keep praying. I knew of a guy once who prayed for his son to become a Christian for 20 years. He prayed every day, multiple times a day. And actually, God, King's ring, that's the right phrase. Uh, but whatever happens, God will be in the waiting when we come to him in prayer. And then thirdly, Maybe actually God is just saying, be patient. 
in the waiting. Easier said than done. God's timing is perfect. God, uh, God is never late. God is never early. God isn't in a hurry. But God will give us grace in the waiting if we ask him. If you'd like to find out more about St Stephen's, please head to our website, follow us on social media or contact the church office.